This week's presentation, we are going to focus on 3rd Nephi, chapters 1 through 7. So let's take a look at some of the doctrines and principles that we can learn to better come unto Christ. 3rd Nephi, chapter 1 through 7. First of all, we're just going to take a look at a general introduction to the book of 3rd Nephi. In the title page to the Book of Mormon, written by the Hand of Moroni, we read that this record is written to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel, and also to Jew and Gentile, for the purpose of convincing them that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. Of course, the entire contents of the Book of Mormon, the book of 3rd Nephi, perhaps makes the most important contribution toward meaning Moroni's stated objectives of convincing Jew and Gentile that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the eternal God, and instructing the house of Israel concerning the great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, and that they may know the covenants of the Lord that are not cast off forever. The account of the Savior's visit is the climax, the apex of the entire Book of Mormon. All previous Book of Mormon writings had pointed forward to that marvelous event, and all things recorded thereafter remind the reader of that event as a symbol of the Lord's climatic second coming that will yet occur. Some who are not intimately familiar with the contents of the book of 3rd Nephi upon hearing that it consists principally of an account of the Savior's ministry on the American continent may wonder whether, if how so, it is any different from the accounts given in the four Gospels of the New Testament. Is 3rd Nephi nothing more than a fifth gospel, adding to new insights but only repetition? As we shall see, 3rd Nephi contains not only an account of the ministry of the resurrected Lord among a group of the inhabitants of the world, but also many additional testimonies of the reality of the resurrection, clarifications of many points of doctrine, and a unique and touching description of the na true nature of the, of the immortal Messiah. These contributions not only are supplemented to the four canonical Gospels, but also are essential to a true understanding of the total mission, total mission of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. While it contains numerous important doctrinal insights, instructions, and clarifications, the unique contributions of 3rd Nephi fall into at least five major categories. Number one, it testifies of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and serves as a second witness of his divinity. The Savior himself declared that one purpose of his visit among the Nephites was that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. In 3rd Nephi, thousands of people, men and women and children, become eyewitnesses of the resurrection and add their testimonies as another testament to those declared by old world witnesses as recorded in the New Testament. Number two, it defines his gospel, clarifies points of doctrine, and teaches the necessity of gospel ordinances. In the world of traditional Christianity, there is so much confusion and contention concerning the true points of Christ's teachings. Often the Bible is interpreted in so many ways that instead of greater understanding, greater confusion results. Jesus was actually aware of such confusion and during his visit to the New World sought to dispel disputations over doctrine. Here we shall see Jesus himself talking in teaching in plainness and power the true points of his doctrine, the necessity of gospel ordinance such as baptism and the sacrament, the vital lifeline of prayer, and how all of these principles are inseparably bonded to the atonement of Jesus Christ. Number three, it explains the purpose of the law of Moses and teaches Jesus' divine role in the law's fulfillment. The Jews, one of the primary audiences for which the Book of Mormon is intended, had waited millennia for their promised Messiah. In 3rd Nephi, we see Jesus authoritatively declaring himself to be the Messiah, the lawgiver, and the fulfillment of the law. 
In 3rd Nephi, we read plain and precious teachings by Jesus concerning the purpose of the Law of Moses, its relationship to the Atonement, and how it is fulfilled in Christ. This is certainly one of the most significant contributions and important messages of 3rd Nephi to the world generally and to the Jews specifically. Number four, it contains important clarifications concerning the other sheep and doctrinal teachings concerning the gathering of Israel. Ye are they of whom I said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, the Savior said to the Nephites. This valuable knowledge that was and still remains hidden from most of the world is revealed in clarity in Third Nephi. We shall not only see the resurrected Lord teaching the Nephites concerning the covenant role in the house of Israel, but also will receive additional information concerning the lost tribes of Israel and the great work of gathering that is to come in the latter days. Number five, it provides us with a unique and touching view of the emotional attributes of a glorified God, the resurrected Christ. No other volume of scripture, either ancient or modern, affords uh, such glimpses into what the resurrected Christ is like, how tenderly he cares for us, and the emotions that a God can possess. We shall see in this book the greatest description in Holy Writ of God's compassion, love, and mercy, his tenderness towards the handicapped and the children, his sorrow and concern for the wicked, and his love and approbation of the righteous. The book of 3rd Nephi is infinitely more than just a fifth gospel. In it, the reader will discover perhaps the greatest written account of the ministry, teachings, and nature of the Lord. It does more than just contribute to an understanding of the doctrines of Christ. It invites all men everywhere to come unto him and partake of his mercy and thereby come to know him as he really is. So with that introduction, let's go to 3 Nephi chapters 1 through 7. 3 Nephi 1 through 7, the following chart is a continuation of what President Ezra Taft Benson said about the books in the Book of Mormon just prior to the Savior's visit to the Nephites being parallel to the Savior's second coming. We have done this with the last three episodes in Helaman, and we finish now with 3 Nephi. Quote, President Benson said, The record of the Nephites' history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. Here are some of those parallels found in 3 Nephi 1 through 7. So we have the references of Christ coming to the Nephites, the event or sign that was given, and how that will parallel Christ's second coming references. So in 1 Nephi 3, 1, the event or sign is righteous prayed for Christ's coming to hasten. Again, that is parallel and will be happening again in DNC 133. Number 2, 3 Nephi 1, 16 through 18, the wicked fear and fall as, as is dead after seeing some as if dead. Sorry about that. The wicked fear and fall as if did after seeing some of the signs and wonders that happened in 3rd Nephi. That will parallel again and happen again according to Dean C. 88 and Moses 7. Number 3, 3rd Nephi 1.18. The righteous watched for the signs in the Book of Mormon. That will happen again, Dean C. 45 and Moses 7. Number 4, 3rd Nephi 29-30. That would probably be chapter 1. I believe, um, I think chapter 1. Wickedness among the youth. 
Isaiah 3, 5, 12 says that will happen again prior to Christ's second coming. Number 5, 3, Nephi 2, 3. The righteous will gather out from the wicked. Again, that will happen according to D.C. 45 and 115. And number 6, 3, Nephi 4. A final terrible battle occurred prior to Christ's birth in 3rd Nephi, that again will parallel and come again according to Joel 2, Revelation 9, and chapter 16 in Revelation. So there are some of the parallels of what did happen and what will happen again prior to Christ's coming. Only those with firm testimonies and full conversions are able to remain steadfast prior to the Savior's appearance in America. The same is true in our day. Only those with firm testimonies and full conversions will be able to remain steadfast prior to the Lord's second coming. A careful study of 3 Nephi 1-7 through will help you understand how your testimony of Jesus Christ and conversion to his gospel will give you the sustaining strength you need to stay true to the Savior during the challenging days in which you live. So let's take a look at now, 3 Nephi chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 4, the phrase, for there, began to be, for there began to be greater signs and greater miracles wrought among the prophets. A God was coming to earth, and all things must be in readiness. The signs of his coming began to be shown forth, just as Samuel and other prophets had predicted. Jesus was and is the greatest of all, pro all the prophets, the prophet's prophet the hope and design of the ages, and his coming needed to be signaled by greater signs and wonders than any other event in history. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, the phrase, There were some who began to say that the time was past for the, worlds to be f for the words to be fulfilled, which were spoken by Samuel the Lamanite. There have always been, and there will always be those who refuse to receive the truth, even when the truth stares them in the face. To the impenitent, the unrepentant, the impure, and the spiritual insensitive, to these the signs of the times are laughable, inconsequential, and unconvincing. In verse 7, the phrase, the people who believe began to be very sorrowful. Even the faithful exist on a hope that eventually, in the due time of the Lord, the arm of God will be bared, the power and promise of the Almighty will be shown forth in the preservation and vindication of the believers. Chapter 1, verse 9, the phrase, All those who believe in those traditions should be put to death except the sign should come to pass. Here we witness a phenomenon which is repeated ad nauseum in the Book of Mormon. The wicked who refuse to believe dare not allow others to believe. Isn't that interesting? How non-believers cannot st stand believers. They just can't seem to leave it alone. There is no room in their tidy, controlled epistemology, epistemological system for faith or spirit or revelation or hope. They do not know, so they conclude that no one else knows. They cannot feel, so they dare not allow others to feel. In this case, they shun the light of evidence that comes from God and refuses others the right to wait patiently on the Lord for the signs to be given. See, it's interesting. It's only the righteous that are truly tolerant. The unrighteous are never tolerant of anybody else or any other things that they do not agree with. Chapter 1, verse 12, the phrase, The Voice of the Lord. These verses cause us to reflect upon what is yet unanswered, unre unrevealed matter, the time when the individual spirit enters the body. This is the day before Jesus is to be born to Mary in Bethlehem of Judea. We would assume that by this time the spirit of Jesus is within that infant body which is housed within the womb of Mary. How then does the voice of Jesus come to Nephi? Does the spirit enter the body at the time of conception, at the beginning of quickening, when the mother first feels signs of life within her, or at the time of physical birth? 
Can it possibly come and go before the time of birth? We do not know. Such has not been made known to us in the latter days. We do know, however, that the words of God are often spoken through his servants by divine investiture of authority. To Adam, the Holy Ghost spoke for and in behalf of the only begotten Son. Such may have been the case here. The Spirit may have been commissioned by the Father to speak to Nephi in the first person for Christ as though Jesus himself were speaking. Another possibility is that an angel acting by that same investiture of divine authority spoke to Nephi the words of Christ. In any event, whether the Lord's words are spoken by himself or by his anointed servants, it is the same. Chapter 1, verse 14, the phrase, To fulfill all things which I have made known. Jesus the Christ was the grand fulfillment of the prophecies. He fulfilled the law of Moses. The law was a one glorious type or shadow or prophecy of Christ. He the Savior was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Chapter 1, verse 14, the phrase, From the foundation of the world. Jesus was and is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation, which is the gospel of God the Father, was taught and understood in our first estate. There it was declare, decreed that this plan would entail a creation, a fall, and an atonement. We knew all of that. We were taught all about that prior to coming here, about the creation, the fall, and the atonement. And there it was that Jehovah, the firstborn of the Father, was chosen and foreordained to be the Redeemer and Savior of all mankind. Joseph Smith spoke of the nature of such premortal argument, agreements, quote, Everlasting covenant was made between three personages before the organization of this earth, and relates to their dispensation of things to men on the earth. These personages, according to Abraham's record, are called God the first, the creator, God the second, the redeemer, and God the third, the witness or testator. Chapter 1, verse 14, the phrase, To do the will, both of the Father and of the Son, of the Father because of me, and of the Son because of my flesh. This is a most difficult passage. It sounds as though the Lord is stating that he will come into the world to fulfill two wills, the will of Jehovah, the premortal God of the ancients, perhaps referred to here as me, and the will of the mortal Messiah, the person of the flesh. Of course, we know that they, Jehovah and Jesus, are one and the same being. At the same time, this statement dramatizes the separation and several roles that would be played by the Master, that of the Holy One of Israel, premortal, and that of Jesus of Nazareth, mortal. There is a sense, then, in which we might speak of the Lord Jehovah acting always under the direction of Elohim, our Heavenly Father, as the one who sent Jesus Christ into the world. Note the following language from the psalmist, quote, The Lord Jehovah said unto my Lord Jesus, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. A similar pattern emerges in the greatest of all messianic prophecies. In speaking of the suffering Savior, Isaiah wrote that, quote, The Lord, meaning Jehovah, hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Further, it pleased the Lord Jehovah to bruise him, Je he, Je Jesus. He, Jehovah, hath put him, Jesus, to grief. In the same vein, the Lord Jehovah spoke to the brother of Jared. Quote, and whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do good is of me, for good cometh of none, save it be of me. I am the same that leadeth men to all good. He that will not believe my words will not believe me, that I am, and he will not believe me, will not believe the Father who sent me. For behold, I am the Father, I am the light and life and the truth of the world. Jehovah Jesus Christ is the eternal Father of heaven and earth. Chapter 1 verses 15 through 21. Those who had doubted the words of Samuel, who in smug self-security had refused to accept the role oracles of an anointed servant of God, now came face to face with reality. 
like those at the second time of the second coming who will have doubted the signs of the times and warnings of the prophets, the unbelievers of the first century were dislodged and upended both physically and spiritually. Chapter 1, verse 22, the phrase, lying sent forth by Satan. Satan always seeks to sow lies whenever there has been a great manifestation of the earth. He tries desperately to confuse, to confound, to complicate things. He works diligently to harden hearts against the plain verities of heaven, as well as against the signs and wonders which are evident among believers. The phrase, the more part of the people were converted unto the Lord, Despite Satan's efforts, great numbers of humble and teachable souls now receive fuel for their faith, evidence that their hope is solid and substantial. Theirs is a true conversion, a conversion to the Lord. They are not convinced because of signs, but rather their faith in Christ is now sustained by signs. That's what signs are given for. Signs are not to convert. Signs are given to those already converted to sustain them and strengthen them. Chapter 1, verses 24 through 25, the phrase, A few that began to preach, endeavoring to prove by the scriptures that it was no more expedient to observe the law of Moses. The peace in the land which has flowed from the faith of believers is punctuated by a doctrinal misunderstanding. There are those who presumably begin to conclude that the birth rather than the death of Christ was to be the moment in history when the law of Moses would be done away. In reality, it is not the life of Christ, albeit that was a matchless example of perfection on which the hinge of eternity turns. Rather, the sufferings and death of Christ put in motion the atoning sacrifice which brought to fulfillment the temporary law, the law of Moses. The scriptures plainly taught that the Lord of life must suffer and die before that law, and especially animal sacrifice, would be done away. That those who preached falsehood in this regard were not malicious in their intent is evident from their speedy conversion to the truth when they were confronted. Chapter 1, verse 29. Many children who did grow up and began to wax strong in years that they became for themselves and were led away by some who were Zoramites by their lines and their flattering words to join the Gadiant and robbers. Verse 29 of 3rd Nephi 1 illustrates that it only takes one generation for apostasy to occur. We read the sad tale of the children of faithful parents who were led away by lines and flattering words to join the Gadian robbers. And so it is today. We are always only one generation away from total apostasy in this church. President Henry B. Irony of the First Presidency taught, quote, The young people of the church hold the future in their hands. The church has always been one generation away from extinction. If a whole generation were lost, which will not happen, we would lose the church, but even a single individual lost to the gospel of Christ closes doors for generation of descendants unless the Lord reaches out to bring some of them back. End of quote. President Gordon Lee B. Hinckley counseled the youth of our day on how to avoid being led away from the truth. Quote, to our young people, the glorious youth of this generation, I say be true. Hold to the faith. Stand firmly for what you know to be right. You, you face tremendous temptation. It comes at you in the halls of popular entertainment, on the internet, in the movies, on television, in cheap literature, and in other ways. Subtitle, su I'm sorry, subtle, titillating, and difficult to resist. Peer pressure may be almost overpowering, but my dear young friends, you must not give in. You must be strong. You must take the long look ahead rather than succumb to the present seductive temptation. You are the best generation we have ever had. You know the gospel better. You are more faithful in your duties. You are stronger to face temptations which come your way. Live by your standard. Pray for the guidance and protection of the Lord. He will never leave you alone. He will comfort you. He will sustain you. He will bless and magnify you and make your reward sweet and beautiful. And you will discover that your example will attract others who will take courage from your strength. End of quote. 
that there will come division in the church, President Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, I testify that as the forces of evil increase under Lucifer's leadership, and as the forces of good increase under the leadership of Jesus Christ, there will be a growing battles between the two until the final confrontation. As the issues become clearer and more obvious, all mankind will eventually be required to align themselves either for the kingdom of God or for the kingdom of the devil. As these conflicts rage, either secretly or openly, the righteous will be tested. God's wrath will soon shake the nations of the earth and will be poured out on the wicked without measure. But God will provide strength for the righteous and the means of escape. And eventually and finally, truth will triumph. End of quote. Let's now take a look at Second Nephi chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, the phrase began to disbelieve all which they had seen and heard. Immediately after the signs of Christ's birth were given, Satan sent forth lies to harden the hearts of the people. Though the impact was not immediate, it was not long before many people became hardened in their hearts and blind in their minds and began to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen. Does this sound, all sound familiar? Consider the following experience some six centuries earlier. And Laman said unto Lamuel, and also unto the sons of Ishmael, Behold, let us slay our father and also our brother Nephi, who has taken upon himself to be our ruler and our teacher, who are his elder brethren. Now he says the Lord has talked with him, and also that angels have ministered unto him. But behold, we know that he lies unto us, and he tells us these things, that he worketh many things by his cunning arts, that he may deceive our eyes. While there is no particular reason to question Satan's power of originality, it would seem that he scarcely needs creative or novel approaches as long as we do not learn from the lessons of the past, as long as we continue to stumble over the same things that ensnare the ancients. May we learn from the scripture, brothers and sisters. May we learn from the wicked and the wickedness of the past and not follow in their paths. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that we too can become vulnerable to Satan's attack on our beliefs. Quote, how quickly Satan moves in every, moves in even where people have had special spiritual experiences, seeking to get people who have seen signs to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen. The adversary has a better chance to persuade us that what we believe is foolish if we worry about looking foolish in front of our fellow man. End of quote. We are going to have to take a stand, and sometimes we will have to stand alone. What is the lesson believers should learn concerning science and salvation? Signs flow from faith and are not a product of it. They strengthen the faithful and produce faith in the spiritually receptive. The chief, pur chief, chief purpose of signs, however, is not to produce faith, but to reward it. Signs do not force faith upon anyone. Sadly, it is common to see both in Scripture and in today's world's most marvelous signs and evidence of God's power ignored or rationalized away by those without faith. Second Nephi 1-4, through four, the phrase, Why do the wicked sometimes see signs? Scripturally, we can see some reasons why the Lord would occasionally show signs to the wicked. 1. To vindicate prophets. The sign that Nephi, son of Helaman, gave to the people concerning the death of the chief judge showed that Nephi was right. Another one. Leave the wicked without excuse. The wicked are completely responsible for their actions thereafter. The Lord has stated, He that seeketh a sign shall see signs, but not unto salvation. Number three, show correctness of prophet's words. Since the wicked seek to improve the prophet's wrong, the Lord will occasionally show indisputable signs. Fourth, condemn the wicked. When the wicked see signs, it is through the Lord's anger and to their condemnation. The Savior stated, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, there began to be wars and contentions throughout all the land. 
there comes a point when a people's only alternative is war. War against that's what would destroy their civilization and way of life. Here the Lamanites and Nephites join hands in an effort to put a stop to the secret murders and robberies, robbings of the band of Gadianton. This they did to maintain their rights and the privileges of the church and of their worship and their freedom and their liberty. Chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. The Book of Mormon is a somber witness of the fact that military might alone cannot promote the general welfare or assure the safety of a nation. Only when a people are strong in spirit and righteousness and behavior do they enjoy the strength of the Lord. Let's now turn to 3 Nephi chapters 3 through 4. We'll do these together. Second, third Nephi chapters 3 through 4, physical and spiritual preparation. It is easy to see Satan's imprint in Gadi and Gid. Gid Adonai's words, 3 Nephi 3, 1 through 10, as he used flattery, verse 2, feigned concern, verse 5, and made false promises, verse 7 through 8, to accomplish his evil designs. How like the devil's promises were Gideon's promises of freedom when all he had to offer was bondage and a promise to share possessions that were not even his to share, verse 7. Lacona straightway turned his attention to his people. He knew they needed to be physically and spiritually prepared for the imminent attack of Gideon's robbers. He had his people build strong fortifications, verse 14, and gather their animals and families, verse 13, into one place, the land of Zarahemla, verses 22-23. He had them make weapons of armor, verse 26, and gather a seven-year supply of provisions, 3 Nephi 4, 4. Laconius instructed his people to leave the deserted land desolate to the robbers, so, desolate so the robbers would not be able to forage f for food. This is chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. Most importantly, Laconius had his people prepare spiritually. He reminded them of the safety of repentance, 3 Nephi 3.15. His people repented and prayed mightily unto the Lord, verse 25, and then chapter 4.8. Thus they wisely prepared themselves both physically and spiritually for the imminent attack of their enemies. We have been asked to prepare physically and spiritually in our day for imminent, imminent calamities. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that what we should do to prepare for the events that precede the second coming, quote, What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? If we knew that we would meet the Lord tomorrow through our permanent death or his unexpected coming, what would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? What accounts would we settle? What forgiveness would we extend? What testimonies would we bear? If we would do those things then, why not now? Why not seek peace while peace can be obtained? If our lamps are prepared, are drawn down, let us start immediately to replenish them. I'm sorry, if our lamps of preparation are drawn down, let's start immediately to replenish them. We need to make both temporal and spiritual preparations for the events prophesied at the second coming. And the preparation most likely to be neglected is the one less visible and more difficult, the spiritual. Are we following the Lord's command, Stand ye in holy places, and be not moved until the day the Lord comes, for behold, it cometh quickly? What are those holy places? Surely they include the temple and its covenants faithfully kept. Surely they include a home where children are treasured and parents are respected. Surely the holy places include our post of duty assigned by priest authority, including missions and callings faithfully fulfilled in branches, wards, and stakes. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 2, the phrase, As if ye were supported by the hand of God. This condescending remark epitomizes the skeptic. He or she is eager to provide alternative explanations for what the faithful believe to be divine intervention. 
Elder Boyd K. Packer taught one thing is for sure. The skeptic will never know, for he will not meet the requirements of faith, humility, and obedience to qualify him for the visitation of the Spirit. End of quote. Chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Here we see a remarkable principle at work. God had commanded the Nephites as a people to fight only defensively, to go to war only as it was necessary to the preservation of their lives, their agency, their families, and their worship. Christians enter war. They do not begin it. Even when it came to taking the initiative in what would appear to be a noble cause to go into the mountains and root out the secret combinations, the sensitive Gid Kadoni declined the suggestion explained that if they did that, his people would not enjoy the approbation and thus the strength of the Lord. We are only in righteousness. We are only able to go to war with righteousness in, from the Lord as defensive measures. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 33, as it was known in the previous chapter, the Nephites are led by men of faith, men who put their trust in the Almighty God, who act and work according to principle. On the other hand, the Gadianton leaders are motivated by greed and gain. They exist solely to acquire. In addition, the Nephite leaders are visionaries. Men who are in tune with the infinite, whose motives are pure and whose attitudes are selfless, who can read clearly the spiritual vital signs of the people they serve. The secret society of Gadianton is directed by malevolent men, persons whose craving for power and profit is so great that they are unable to make the kind of reasoned judgments and the kind of far-reaching preparations which would stand them in good stead in the future. Despite their terrible appearance, the Gadianton warriors were no match for Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. He who promises to fight the battles of the faithful are of those who hearken to his word and go to at his call. Even he defeated the secret societies in this episode. Yes, the Nephites were properly prepared for war, for war but God was their general, and he it was who brought the victory. Gideoni was slain while fleeing from the battle. The robber's next leader, Zemnariha, was hanged on a tree, and those followers who did not suffer similar death became prisoners of the Nephites. Chapter 4, verse 10, For the phrase for the Nephites did not fear them, but they did fear their God. Faith in God can overcome fear. The Nephites prepared themselves physically and spiritually to meet Gideonhai's robbers as a final act of submission to the Lord, which was mis interpreted by their foes, they fell to the earth and cried unto the Lord. They then stood on their feet and met their enemy with faith in God. We too can stand up to our enemies and replace our fears with faith in God. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, wrote concerning the faith that is needed to face the challenges of our day, quote, Preparing ourselves and our families for the challenges of the coming years will require us to replace fear with faith. We must be able to overcome the fear of enemies who oppose and threaten us. The Lord has said, Fear not, little flock. Do good. Let earth and hell combine against you. For if ye are built upon my rock, they cannot prevail. End of quote. What a tremendous blessing and promise from the Savior. Chapter three, 4, verse 33. The phrase, Their hearts were swollen with joy unto the gushing out of many tears. Those who have been delivered by the Almighty, whether from warring hordes or from satanic minions, let their voices ascend to the heaven in praise and thanksgiving. Tears come easily as they stand all amazed at God's mercy and sing out with joyful adoration, How great thou art! The source of their deliverance is no secret. They know full well that their reliance upon Jehovah and their willingness to trust in him are what led to victory over their enemies. Let's go now to 3 Nephi, chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, the phrase, Faith leads to repentance and all good works. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder John H. Groberg explained the relationship between faith and repentance. Quote, 
If we think deeply, we realize that the first principle, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, underlies all else. That is, it takes faith in Christ to repent or be baptized or perform any other ordinances of the gospel. Jesus made saving repentance possible and made baptism meaningful. If we have faith in him, we will repent and be baptized. If we do not repent or refuse to be baptized or are unwilling to keep his commandments, it is because we do not have sufficient faith in him. Thus, repentance, baptism, and all other principles and ordinances are not entirely separated, but are actually extensions of our faith in Christ. Without faith in him, we do little of eternal value. With faith in him, our lives become focused on doing things of eternal value. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 3, Abominations. The reference is to evil doctrines and practices, the kinds of things normally associated with idol worship. It includes moral defilements. An abomination is something that evokes extreme detestation, especially as constant, contrasted with that which is pure and holy. The word whoredoms. The word whore comes from a root meaning to hire. Whoredoms involve immoral commerce with the opposite sex or often in scriptural. In scriptures, sexual sins generally. Chapter 5, verse 8. This book cannot contain even a hundredth part. Here, Mormon, the editor and compiler of the Book of Mormon, tells us that he could not include the hundredth part of the events that took place during this 25-year period of Nephite history, the elapsed time as they now reckoned it since Christ's birth. Scriptures are, by their very nature, fragmentary and abbreviated accounts of both the events they describe and the doctrine and teachings of the prophets they quote. No scriptural record is complete. All scripture requires the Holy Ghost to carry our understanding beyond the written record. Of the vision of the degrees of glory, Joseph Smith said, I could explain a hundred times more than I ever have of the glories of the kingdom manifested to me to me in the visions where I permitted and were the people prepared to receive them. God will only give us that part of his gospel, Father, brothers and sisters, that we are prepared for. Chapter 5, verse 9. A shorter but true account was given by Nephi. Reference here appears to be to Nephi, son of Nephi, son of Helaman, who continued the writings on the large plates. The record to which reference is made is one covering the 25-year period since the sign was given, announcing the birth of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 12, I am called Mormon. This is the first time in the abridgment of the large plates that Mormon identifies himself by name. His name appears in the words of Mormon, but that book is at the end of the small plates of Nephi. The name of Mormon's father was Mormon, and chronologically the first book of Mormon mentioned of the name occurs about 450 years before his birth, when Alma is teaching his followers at the waters of Mormon in the land of Mormon. The prophet Joseph Smith linked the word Mormon with the meaning more good. For a look at what the name Mormon has come to mean in this last dispensation, you can see President Gordon B. Hinckley's talk in the end, November Ensign of 1990. That would have been the October General Conference of 1990. Chapter 5, verse 12. The first church which was established among them after their transgression. This is in reference to when Alma and his followers escaped the perverse jurisdiction of wicked King Noah, established a church in the wilderness. Chapter 5, verse 13, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Mormon described himself as a disciple of Christ. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained the nature of Mormon's calling. Quote, While in every instance the Nephite Twelve are spoken of as disciples, the fact remains that they have been endowed with divine authority to be special witnesses for Christ among their own pe people. Therefore, they are virtually apostles to the Nephite race, although their jurisdiction was, as revealed to Nephi, eventually to be subject to the authority and jurisdiction of Peter and the twelve chosen in Palestine. 
while Mormon's personal call is that of an apostle, the term disciple can have a more general definition. A disciple is also a follower of Jesus Christ who lives according to Christ's teachings. Elder L. Tom Perry, a quorum of the Twelve Apostles, further explained, quote, The following has been written about discipleship. The word disciple comes from the Latin meaning a learner. A disciple of Christ is one who is learning to be like Christ, learning to think, to feel, to act as he does, to be a true disciple, to fulfill that learning task is the most demanding regime known to man. No other discipline compares in either requirements or rewards. It involves the total transformation of a person from the state of the natural man to that of a saint, one who loves the Lord and serves all and serves with all his heart, might, mind, and strength. End of quote. In addition to speaking about discipleship, Mormon here may be making a statement about his authority, not just as a disciple, but as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 18. The phrase, I know the record which I make to be a just and true record. Mormon testifies relative to the authenticity of his record. For him to say that this record is just is to say that it is right and lawful. For him to say that it is true it is to attest that it is correct, reliable, or trustworthy. Thus his testimony is that the record he has preserved on gold plates is a reliable account of true and righteous principles. Chapter 5, verse 23 through 26, The Meaning of the Gathering in the Latter Days. The theme of these verses is repetitious in the Book of Mormon, and most appropriately so. The Book of Mormon is the book ordained in the councils of heaven by which to gather Israel from the four corners of the earth. The great message and testimony of the Book of Mormon is that all who believe in Christ as the Son of God and keep His commandments shall have eternal life. That being the message, and the book being the messenger, then it ought to be clear that the gathering is, and must always be, first to Christ, and that no assembling of any people in the lands is of any lasting moments unless they have first embraced the doctrine and testimony of Christ as taught in the Book of Mormon. The testimony of these verses is that the tribe of Joseph, which along with all the tribes of Jacob, has been scattered among all peoples throughout the earth, will in the last days be restored to that covenant relationship known to their ancient fathers. That is, they shall come to know their Redeemer, who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. End of quote. Elder Dallin H. Oaks explained the meaning and purpose of the gathering. Quote, Another sign of the times is the gathering of the faithful. In the early years of this last dispensation, a gathering to Zion involved various locations in the United States, to Kirtland, to Missouri, to Nauvoo, and to the tops of the mountains. Always these were gatherings to prospective temples. With the creation of stakes and the construction of temples in most nations with sizable populations of the faithful, the current commandment is not to gather to one place, but to gather in stakes in our own homelands. There, are faith, there the faithful can enjoy the full blessings of eternity in a house of the Lord. There in their own homelands they can obey the Lord's command to enlarge the borders of his people and strengthen her stakes. In this way, the stakes of Zion are for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 26, the phrase, And then shall they know their Redeemer, and then shall they be gathered in. Here again we see the order of gathering, first spiritually to Christ's gospel, and second temporally, to the lands or congregations of the saints. Let's now turn to 3rd Nephi, chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 4, Equity and Justice. Equity and justice are chief among the laws that rule the kingdom of heaven. Describing the coming of Christ, Alma prophesied, saying, Not many days hence the Son of God shall come in glory, and his glory shall be the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, equity, and truth, full of patience, mercy, and long-suffering, quick to hear the cries of his people and to answer their prayers. Among the Lord's people, 
equality, and that's what he means by equity, equality and justice must always prevail. All who are or who can be called saints must learn to live in a state of equality, one with another. Describing such a state, the Lord spoke to our generation, saying, In your temporal things you shall be equal, and this not grudgingly, otherwise the abundance of the manifestations of the Spirit shall be withheld. For if you are not equal in earthly things, you cannot be equal in obtaining heavenly things. This is why we give a tithe and a generous, a very generous fast offering. Chapter 6, verse 10, Pride and Boastings. Pride and boastings are the twin devils who sow the seeds of corruption and destruction among the nation of the Nephites. It is difficult to read this chapter without a strong feeling that this part of Nephite history is being recounted as a warning to us of the latter days. In chapter 10, the phrase, Exceedingly great riches, Woe unto the rich, Jacob warned, who are rich as to the things of the world. For because they are rich, they despise the poor, and they persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their, rich, their treasures. Wherefore their treasures is their God, and behold, their treasures shall perish with them also. There is nothing wrong with being rich. It is where our heart is, and if that is where our treasure is, and we have love upon our riches above the love of God, then they are a detriment to us. Chapter 6, verse 12, Prosperity and Peace Can Lead to Pride. During the years immediately prior to the Savior's personal ministry among the Nephites, the people enjoyed a period of brief prosperity. Unfortunately, this temporal success led to pride and boastings because of their exceedingly great riches. Today, we have the same warning. It can lead to the same thing, and in some cases, it has in our day. Has it with you personally? That is something we all have to ponder. President Henry B. Eyring warned about such challenges in our day. Quote, a little prosperity and peace, or even a turn slightly for the better, can bring us feelings of self-sufficiency. We can feel quickly that we are in control of our lives, that the change for the better is our own doing, not that of a God who communicates to us through the still, small voice of the Spirit. Pride creates a noise within us which makes the quiet voice of the Spirit hard to hear. And soon, in our vanity, we no longer even listen for it. We can come quickly to think we don't need it. End of quote. Several times in the Book of Mormon history, the people pass through a cycle of righteousness, prosperity, riches, pride, wickedness, destruction, humility, and righteousness again. Here is the famous pride cycle. Book of Mormon history reveals a recurring cycle that underlines the rise and fall of all nations as well as individual. This cycle is especially clear in Helaman's 3 through 12 and 3rd Nephi 5 through 9. Mormon gave a summary of this cycle in Helaman 12, 2 through 6. Notice how the Nephites go from unrighteous to righteous and back to unrighteous again in relatively short periods of time. The same tragic cycle also occurred within the Jaredite nation. The following illustration shows the cycle of righteousness and wickedness repeated throughout the books of Helaman and 3rd Nephi. I'll let you take a look at that and you can read those references. One, they get blessed. Two, because of that, pride strikes up. Three, they get warned by prophets of their pride. Four, destruction and suffering comes because they won't repent of the pride. And then they humble themselves because they're about to come distinct. And then God, because they are obedient, blesses them again. Some may ask, well, why does God bless them again when he knows they'll go through the cycle? Because, as it says, I, the Lord, am bound when ye do what I say. DNC 82.10. When we obey, God is bound to bless us. What we have to do as fallen creatures from the fall is learn how to be blessed by the Lord and not become prideful. And that will take us and able to do that, that will, we will have to always remember Christ so that we may always have his spirit to be with us. 
because the Lord is bound to bless us when we are obedient, we have to learn how to say righteous as we are blessed with prosperity and riches, learning, etc. This the Nephites never did figure out how to do. Thus their pride and reliance in themselves will lead to their utter destruction. To be exalted is to inherit all that God has, which includes all knowledge, wealth, and power. However, God does not permit these things to overcome him into boastings and pride. Therefore, we must learn to be the same in inheriting great blessings, yet remaining humble, submissive, meek, etc. The key that the Nephites missed is that in order to accomplish this, we must always remember him, Christ, and that without him we are nothing, unworthy creatures because of our fallen nature of the natural man. That's how you break the solid. The, the pride cycle is always remember him. Do you see why the sacrament each week is so important? It's to help us to break the pride cycle in our lives. Chapter 6, verse 13. Some were lifted up in pride and others were exceedingly humble. We determine our response to circumstances. The record states that some were lifted up in pride and others were exceedingly humble. Each of us must determine which way we are going to turn. Elder Marvin J. Ashner, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught this principle. Certainly, one of our God-given privileges is the right to choose what our attitude will be in any given set of circumstances. We can let the events that surround us determine our actions, or we can personally take charge and rule our lives using a as guidelines the principles of pure religion. Pure religion is learning the gospel of Jesus Christ and then putting it into action. Nothing will ever be of real benefit to us unless it is incorporated into our own lives. End of quote. Chapter 6 verses 14 through 18. The phrase, these events parallel our own day, as we have been learning these last few presentations. President Ezra Taft Benson taught that the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit has parallels to our own day. He stated, quote, recently I have been reading again the marvelous account in the Book of Mormon of the visit of the resurrected Savior to the American continent. As Easter approaches, I have been deeply impressed with the beauty and power of this scriptural account in 3 Nephi and with its great value for our time and our generation. The record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. The Nephite civilization had reached great heights. They were prosperous and industrious. They had built many cities with great highways connecting them. They engaged in shipping and trade. They built temples and palaces. But as so often happens, the people rejected the Lord. Pride became a commonplace. Dishonesty and immorality were widespread. Secret combinations flourished because, as Helaman tells us, the Gadian robbers had seduced the more part of the righteous until they had come down to believe in their works and partake of their spoils. The people began to be distinguished by ranks according to their riches and their chances of learning. And Satan had great power unto the stirring of the people to do all manner of iniquity and to the puffing them up with pride, tempting them to seek for power and authority and riches and the vain things of the world, even as today. Mormon noted that the Nephites did not sin ignorantly, for they knew the will of God concerning them. There were but few righteous among them. Nephi led the church with great power and performed many miracles, yet there were but few who were converted unto the Lord. The people as a whole rejected the Lord. They stoned the prophets and persecuted those who sought to follow Christ. End of quote. We will probably see the same as it approaches the second coming and as Christ comes, that the majority of people will reject the signs and reject Christ's second coming. Chapter 6, verse 15, power and authority and riches. How ironic it is that this threesome makes so many susceptible to the wiles of the adversary when each of the three could be used to such marvelous effect in the cause of righteousness. That is interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Power, authority, and riches can be used for wickedness or can be used to further the cause of righteousness. How are we using them? Chapter 6, verse 18, willful rebel against God. 
Whereas the Spirit of Christ is typified by his submission to the will of Father, the Spirit of Lucifer was captured in his rebellion against God. Again, it is ironic that many who refuse to submit to the will of the Father in heaven, how so submissively to the will of the Father of darkness. See, we are going to submit one way or another to something. Either we will submit to the Father of darkness, Satan, or we will humble ourselves and submit our wills to the will of the Father and the Son. Satan, who rebelled against God in our premortal existence, seeks to stir up rebellion among the saints of God. The danger of willful participation in sin has to do with the voice we choose to follow. King Benjamin warned, And now I say unto you, my brethren, that after you have known and have been taught all these things, if ye should transgress and go contrary to that which has been spoken, I say unto you that the man that doeth this, the same cometh out in open rebellion against God. Therefore he listeth to obey the evil spirit, and becometh an enemy to all righteousness. Therefore the Lord hath no place in him, for he dwelleth not in unholy temples. Open rebellion against God makes you an enemy to him. And so God must now fight you and bring his judgments down against the rebellious. In connection with this, Elder Neil A. Maxwell observed, quote, Surely it should give us more pause than it does to think of how casually we sometimes give to Satan, or who could not control his own ego into the premortal world, such awful control over our egos here. We often let the adversary do indirectly now what we refuse to let him to do directly then. End of quote. Elder M. Russell Ballard further explained the danger of heeding Satan's temptations. Quote, In the pre-mortal world, before we left the presence of the Father, he warned and cautioned us about new experiences we would have in mortality. We knew that we would have a physical body of flesh and bone. Never having been mortal before, we had no experience dealing with the temptations of mortality. But Heavenly Father knew and understood. He charged us to control our mortal bodies and to make them subject to our spirits. Our spirits would have to master the physical temptations that our bodies would encounter in a temporal world. Spiritual power over the influence of Satan comes to us by keeping the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan will seek to tempt us at times and in ways that exploit our greatest weaknesses or destroy our strength. But his promises of pleasure are short-lived deceptions. His evil design is to tempt us into sinning, knowing that when we sin, we separate ourselves from our Heavenly Father and the Savior, Jesus Christ. We begin to move away from Heavenly Father's promised blessings towards the misery and anguish in which Satan and his followers languish. By sinning, we put ourselves into Satan's power. Now, my dear young friends, I understand the struggles you face every day in keeping the commandments of the Lord. The battle for your soul is increasingly fierce. The adversary is strong and cunning. However, you have within your physical body the powerful spirit of a son or daughter of God. Because he loves you and wants you to come home to him, our Father in heaven has given you a conscience that tells your spirit when you are keeping the Lord's commandments and when you are not. If you will pay more attention, if, if you will if you will pay more attention to your spiritual self, which is eternal, than to your mortal self, which is temporal, you can always resist the temptations of Satan and conquer his efforts to take you into his power. End of quote. What a blessing. You can always, not sometimes, not maybe, always resist Satan if we'll just pay more attention to our spiritual selves. Chapter 6, verse 20, They did testify boldly of his death and sufferings. In our day, a binding testimony of Christ must embrace a witness that Joseph Smith was the prophet for whom the only true and living church on the face of the whole earth has been restored. It must also embrace the testimony of Christ as he is represented in the Book of Mormon. The Jewish hope of a Messiah was for a conquering hero, not a suffering servant who would willingly down, lay down his life. Thus, in the meridian of time, a binding testimony of Christ who had to include the necessity of his suffering and death and the reality of, its, of his resurrection. 
This was also the testimony of the prophets who taught in the new world. I'm sorry I got that wrong. And the reality of his resurrection. Chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. Here we see that the satanic secret combinations are in full bloom. The mayhem principle, the perversion dictum that one may murder to get gain reigns supreme in their society. Chapter 6, verse 28. That covenant which was given by them of old, which covenant was given and administered by the devil. Cain, who became Master Mahan, was the first to enter into such a covenant. Satan said unto the king, Swear unto me by thy throat, and if thou tell it, thou shalt die. And swear thy brethren by their heads, and by the living God, that they tell it not. For if they tell it, they shall surely die. And this that thy father may not know it, and this day I will deliver thy brother Abel into thine hands. And Satan swore unto Cain that he would do according to his commands. And all these things were done in secret. And Cain said, Truly, I am Mahan, the master of this great secret, that I may murder and get gain. Wherefore Cain was called Master Mahan, and he gloried in his wickedness. Hugh Nibley has spoken of the great secret involved in converting life into property. Cain got the degree of Master Mahan, tried the system out on his brother, and gloried in its brilliant success, declaring that at last he could be free, as only property makes free, and that Abel had been a loser in a free competition. Chapter 3, Chapter thir or 13, fight, Chapter 7. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. The brotherhood of evil, with its secret combinations, now made laws and government meaningless, whereas previously the gospel light and truth had united the people in a common interest. The gospel of darkness and iniquity now divided them into a host of squabbling tribes, whereas equality and justice earlier had reached out with equal warmth to the great and the small. Now self-interest and group interest sought advantage one over another. This is similar to the day of the false ideologies and philosophies of DEI and intersectionality that divides people into groups, tribes, to war against each other. Thus the unity of Zion society is destroyed. Christ is not interested in diversity. He is interested in unity and becoming one in heart and mind with him. 7 verse 8 like that should be like like the dog to his vomit or like the sow, sow, the sow to her wallowing in the mire those repentant ones who have been cleansed from sin and later return to their evil ways are likened to a dog eating its own vomit or to a sow that has been cleansed but returns to wallowing in its mire. Chapter 7, verse 9, a man whom they did call Jacob. Jacob is a Hebrew name meaning supplant or deceive. Jacob, an evil and vile man, came to prominence through his role in the slaying of the prophets sent to declare repentance to the Nephites. He then became a leader among those who bound themselves together with unholy oaths and covenants. The purpose of their conspiracy was to destroy the republic and establish a monarchy. Having assassinated the chief judge, Jacob's supporters proclaimed Jacob king. Chapter 7, verse 15 through 26, The Faithfulness of Nephi and His Followers One bright spot in the otherwise sad account of the Nephites' turn from their righteousness is the steadfast faithfulness of Nephi and his people. Their example provides a pattern to help us maintain our righteousness during times of weakness. We read of Nephi's firm testimony, born of personal experience, that he boldly taught repentance and remission of sins through faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. He ministered with power and authority because great was his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18, and those who responded to his testimony were themselves visited by the power and spirit of God. Verse 21, and those who believed were healed. Verse 22, repented, were baptized, and received a remission of their sins. Verses 24 through 25. 
chapter 7, verse 18, not possible that they could disbelieve his words. Nephi spoke with such convincing power that it was impossible to deny the truthfulness of what that which he taught. Such is the authority of the Spirit. Of the sons of Mosiah, we are told that they were diligent students of the Scriptures, and therefore men of sound understanding. But this is not all. They had given unto them to much prayer and fasting. Therefore they had the same Spirit. Uh, therefore they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation and when they taught they taught with power and authority of God such is the pattern for the Lord's servants and such was the example of the master himself of whom it was said he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes of Enoch it was said that his faith was so great that he led the people of God and their enemies came to battle against them and he spake the word of the Lord and the earth trembled and the mountains fled even according to his command and the rivers of water were turned out of their course and the roar of lions was heard out of the wilderness and all nations feared greatly so powerful were the word of Enoch and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. Chapter 7, verse 20. The phrase, were angry with him because of his power. The spirit of anger is not born of doubt. In any case, God's existence is not the issue here. Nor is it a matter of truth versus error, for the teachings of Nephi could not be denied. The issue was simply one of spirits. Those who had so given themselves up to the spirit of the adversary feasted upon anger and hatred and lost their appetite for peace. For, for spirit of peace, joy, and love, which accompany the gospel and the obedient spirit. Chapter 7, verse 21 through 26, the phrase, There were but few who were converted unto the Lord. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the difference between those who are fully converted and those who are still lacking. He further taught the continual need for a cycle of conversion which builds steadiness in true followers of Christ. Quote, Each of us has observed how some individuals go through life consistently doing the right things. When difficult choices are to be made, they seem to invariably make the right ones, even though they were enticing alternatives available to them. We know that they are subject to temptation, but they seem oblivious to it. Likewise, we have observed how others are not so valiant in the decisions they make. In a powerful spiritual environment, they resolve to do better, yet they are soon back doing the same things they resolve to abandon. Sometimes the word converted is used to describe when a sincere individual decides to be baptized. However, conversion means far more than that. President Marion G. Romney explained conversion. Converted means to turn from one belief or course of action to another. Conversion is a spiritual moral change. Converted implies not merely mental acceptance of Christ and his teachings, but also a motivating faith in him and his gospel, a faith which works, a transformation, an actual change in one's understanding of life's meaning and in his allegiance to God in interest, to God's interest in thought and in conduct. Um, meaning and in his intelligence to God, to God in interest, in thought and conduct. In one who is really wholly converted, desire for things contrary to the gospel of Christ has actually died, and substitute therefore is a love of God with a fixed controlling determination to keep his commandments. Stated simply, true conversion is the fruit of faith, repentance, and constant obedience. Faith comes by hearing the word of God and responding to it. You will receive from the Holy Ghost a confirming witness of things you accept on faith by willing to do them. You will be led to repent of errors resulting from wrong things done or right things not done. As a consequence, your capacity to consistently obey will be strengthened. This cycle of faith, repentance, and consistent obedience will lead you to greater conversion with its attendant blessings. End of Elder Scott's quote. There is no spiritual aristocracy. Those newly born to the faith are as entitled to the attentions and blessings of a loving father as their older brothers and sisters. 
True it is that those more mature in spiritual things may be entrusted with greater authority and power, but this is not to say, as was the case in this instance, that the newly converted are without the power to dream dreams, see visions, prophesy, work miracles, and generally enjoy those signs that naturally follow faith and obedience. Chapter 7, verse 24, There were none who were brought unto repentance who were not baptized with water. Baptism is the straight gate by which all must enter. Nephi described this sacred ordinance as both the straight path and the narrow gate. The first fruits of repentance, Mormon wrote, is baptism. And baptism cometh because of faith unto the filling of the commandments. And the filling of the commandments bringeth remission of sins. Baptism witnessed to both God and man that our spirit is contrite and humble, and that we are willing to take upon the name of Christ upon us. Baptism by immersion symbolizes the Christian commitment to Christ, the acceptance of our Lord's death, burial, and rise unto a newness of life. So let's not let's stop teaching that baptism is symbolic of being washed clean. Little children have nothing to be washed clean of, or even those who are older who convert to the church. What washes us as clean is the Holy Ghost. Once you receive that after baptism, the symbolism of baptism is the death and burial of Christ, arising a new person in Christ. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you with some of the doctrine and principles in these chapters. If it did, please hit the like button.